Hello everybody and welcome back to Romania Law School. So I had the great opportunity to speak with uh, one of my uh, motorcycling mentor and the mentor for many many people with Chris Burge through an event organized by Turatec Romania um, where uh, we asked we get to ask him some very interesting questions uh, related to the motorcycles. I will post only the part where I asked the uh, questions uh, that interest me the most but you can watch the whole video and the whole event on the YouTube page of Turatec Romania so for this it is not long just stay with me because it is very very interesting ciao be bad <laughs> so <laughs> I'm like, hey, do you guys want to come to a ride a training school with me? <laughs> <laughs> they are so lucky to have you with them, so you can easily teach anyone. You know, anytime they want to learn, they just jump on the bike and go and ride with you. Yeah, it was good. I, I was actually the student today. So it was uh, a purely road riding school, so it's good to, uh, yeah, good to be the student sometimes too. Chris, I'm, ve I'm very curious. What are, what are they riding? Uh, my they mom's riding a three, uh, 390 Duke mm -hmm. ATM, and my dad's riding it. He used to ride an 1190, uh, but he's recently sold it and he's just bought a uh, Suzuki V Strom 650. So it's we give him a hard time, but it's it's a lot <laughs> lower, it's a lot more gentle for a grandfather, but he loves it. Oh, yeah. he, keeps, he keeps wanting me to ride it though, and it's so boring. <laughs> Chris, I was I was curious. Um, uh, is there any any brand that you didn't uh, that you didn't uh, try, right? Oh yeah, I mean there's there's so many uh, bike manufacturers out there now. It's, it's it's almost hard to keep up with all of them. Um, but luck, luckily, we're doing the... to the adventure bikes. Um, no, I, I get to try most of them because uh, when we do the riding schools, I always end up jumping on different people's bikes yeah. and yeah, and it's good as well. You know, it's I, with some of the different uh, some of the adventure bikes, they're they're quite different to ride. For example, like the, the big BMWs, uh, they some of the techniques are a bit different. So it's good to make sure that I'm not teaching people too specifically what works for me in my KTM world. It's good to get the feelings of all these different bikes. Mm -hmm. Nice. Uh, we will um, wait a few minutes until um, uh, nine and ten to to um, uh, to see who's going to log in, and um, sure. yeah, so then we can chat a little bit. So, guys, you can use this opportunity to unmute. I I see a lot of people that are muted at the moment. And how are things in Romania? No, here heavy snow. At least in my in the south side of uh, Romania. Heavy yeah. snow, minus five, minus seven degrees Celsius. Not horrible. We are used to much lower, but yeah, yeah. No, it's, it's, it's not that bad. Okay. And the COVID situation is not... It's a little bit stable. Um, we used to have rougher times. Now it's not, uh, we are not in a lockdown, but there are some restrictions uh, related to uh, free circulation during the night, but not more than this. Okay, uh, that's good. It seems to, to improve the vaccination campaign started uh, with the okay. old people now, with the, 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 the risk category of people. Uh, it seems to, to, to go into a, let's say, a normal situation. Oh, excellent, that, that's good. Um, how, how is New Zealand? You're, still, you're not in lockdown, right? No, so New Zealand's quite a unique situation. Uh, we basically, we have zero COVID in our country. Um, but the downside with that is we really, as a country, we really want to protect that. So our border is closed. <laughs> so you're, you're living oh. here, you're, you're like in a, in a paradise because this is how it's uh, New Zealand. You're like in, like in a paradise, you can go to restaurants, you can go to parties, you can do whatever you want, but you cannot get out of the country and nobody can, can't get in, right? Well, that's, that's, uh, you can go, you just can't come back. <laughs> 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 okay. Uh, no, I, sh I shouldn't say you can't, but uh, to come back, you have to. Uh, there's a minimum of uh, a two-week quarantine in a uh, in a quarantine uh, isolation facility, which costs about three thousand dollars, and there's many restricted places to it. So yeah, it's it's 
Yeah, we're, we're trapped in paradise is a good way to describe it. Okay. Uh, uh, Chris, are you watching the Dakar race? Yeah, very much so. Yeah. Ah, uh, yeah. And what do you think about the, the, the latest uh, uh, situation looked, unfolding there? It looked like a tough race. Um, mm -hmm. This year I, I sat there and I thought, I, I, I never thought I wanted to be there. Uh, it looks... <laughs> It looks like they've made the navigation really tough, and I, I think in some ways that's taken away from the racing. Um, it's one thing when you use the navigation to slow the competitors down, to make it safer, that sort of thing. But when the terrain's really open, you're going really fast, and the navigation's really tough, it's not that much fun. Yeah. And, you went, to, you went to Dakar, but uh, Chris, I, I, I saw that you went to Dakar to Red Bull Maniacs, you won the, the title, and uh, to GS Trophy, as well as the Roof of Africa. What exactly is Roof of Africa? So the Roof of Africa is a really cool race. It's been going since the, uh, the 1970s, I think. Um, and it's it started off as, a, as like a Baja sort of race across uh, the country of Lesotho. Mm -hmm. So if you look at the map of South Africa, there's a little square in the middle of it, and that's Lesotho. It's yeah. one of the very few countries in the world completely surrounded by one other country. And it's it's a very poor country, but it has amazing mountains. And it's uh, one of the, probably the first ever hard enduro race. So it's it's a really big, important, like, sporting event for, for South Africa. Uh, it's a big event for them. And uh, yeah, I was fortunate enough to, to win it uh, three years in a row. Wow! So, <laughs> yeah, nice yeah. surprise, anyway. <laughs> yeah, so that, that was the first uh, first hard, international hard enduro race I ever won, and it that they, that race definitely changed my life. And you know, South Africa and Lesotho is a really important part of the world for me. I spent I lived there for two years. I uh, just fell in love with the place. Very nice. Always, places in the world to ride on Romania, South Africa, and uh, Canada. Ah, since you mentioned it, uh, Chris, except the Romaniacs, did you have the chance to ride in our mountains more than Sibiu? Uh, not a heck of a lot, no. Um, I, did mm. a, I did another race called uh, the King of the Hill mm -hmm. uh, many Oof. years ago. It wasn't very good. Um, but no, I, uh, we did a we rode some bikes from Sibiu across the mountains uh, to to um, to Bucharest, and that, that's pretty much been that. Uh, unfortunately, in all the times that I I've, I've been to Romania, I've been there. I think uh, I was trying to count eleven times. I've always just you know I've never had any money, so it's, you know you can really just afford to do the race. So you fly in, do the race, get home, get back to work, sort of thing. So I haven't really had the chance to uh, to explore it the way that I should have done. Yeah, next time you're here, don't worry about the money. Just send the word, man. Come on. I think there are 100 <laughs> yeah, million I... people coming to help you. Yeah, <laughs> Romania is a cool place. I can't. I love to explore it on an adventure bike. It must be amazing. Yes, and you are always yes. welcome, Chris. You and Monica and Zoe as well. I think uh, I think they will love it too because it's so different from New Zealand. It's really, really different. You know that. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it's, it's, it's a beautiful place for sure. And a, a good story about Romania. Uh, the, the last time I went to Romaniacs, uh, I, Monica and my daughter Zoe came as well. Oh. And Zoe uh, was asleep when we arrived in Romania and she asleep in the taxi all the way to the motel or to the, the, uh, the pension where we were staying. We got up, woke up in the morning and uh, said, Zoe, that's it, we're here, we're in Romania. Uh, no, no, this is not Romania. <laughs> uh, I was no, Daddy. We are not in Romania, this is not Romania. And it wasn't until that we took her into Sibiu and showed her where they were building the prologue track for Romania. She's like, that's it! We're in Romania! <laughs> <laughs> oh God, I, I wished I, we could uh, meet uh, earlier, but uh, it's never too late. 
maybe you can um, you can um, uh, tell us um, uh, a little bit about the famous "Say No to Slow" video serial. Um, a lot of people have bought the the, the serial. They already watch it, and it, they say that it's so simple to understand and so nice. Um, okay. My colleague Yonut already put the, the link in the chat, so you can copy the link in the chat. Um, do we go to Dakar after we watch this uh, serial, uh, Chris? Uh, no, 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 you don't. <laughs> it's it's more, uh, we just, so the, the history behind doing this, um, I'm in a really fortunate position of uh, people asking me all the time, like, hey, you know, come to Romania. Hey, come to all these amazing places around the world. And, you know, I, I say yes to as much as I can. But obviously, I end up having to say no to a lot of it because just, it just doesn't work. You know, I, I live on the other side of the planet and I like my family and I don't want to just wave goodbye to them for the whole year. So we wanted to come up with a way of, uh, of helping people out, you know, being able to help them with their writing, assist them with their writing without me physically having to go there and not having to live my entire life in an aeroplane. And so we've been building up the series, uh, the, the, the footage for, for a long time. It's taken us a long time to, to do it. And then um, as COVID hit New Zealand and we went into lockdown, uh, we went into a complete panic. So my whole plan for making a living and supporting my family involves meeting large groups of people, traveling, all that sort of stuff. That was just completely wiped out. Um, so that was the big motive. I'm like, oh my God, like, how am I gonna pay my mortgage? What the hell am I gonna do? Okay, let's get the series going. And so we, that was the final motivation to try and push this thing out. And uh, thankfully, it, it went well. And it, it went from like, it saved my ass last year, basically. Uh -huh. It's it's really good. It's really good. And um, we, we have great feedback from people who have uh, already Excellent. seen it. So, um... so we've just, we've just uh, last week started filming the, uh, the next series. Oh, wonderful! Uh, yeah. the next It'll series, take us a while. How is it going to be? Uh, it's going to be focused around the enduro bikes, around the little bikes. Mm -hmm. uh, so that the plan is we'll do, we've done the adventure one, we'll do the enduro one, and then we'll do a follow up, a second series of the adventure one as well. Yeah, but it, it all takes a while. It takes us weeks and weeks and weeks to film it. Well, we're looking forward to, to see the new series, serial as well. Yeah, oh, it, it's it, I'm really stoked at how successful it's been like the the, uh, the feedback we get from people has just been so cool uh, it, it's been well and above what we ever 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 thought it might be so yeah both, both in terms of you know the, the response we've got from people and in sales as well to be honest mm -hmm. <laughs> um i think that we can uh, we can start the meeting because um, um, um it's uh it's already a little bit late we don't want to keep you so much chris i know you no, want to protect your family <laughs> so okay. we can uh, we can start the discussions and uh, because um uh, we have ladies here yeah <laughs> ladies first so ramona uh please take the initiative and um you can start the questions uh, to, thank, to Chris. Thank you, Maria. Uh, thank you, Chris, for being with us today. Um, I watched part of your series because it's like a school online, which I'm attending whenever I got the chance. I really enjoyed the, the online course that uh, it was recommended to me by a friend who is uh, more experienced than I am. So um, I will start apologizing for, uh, to those who have more experience than me. Uh, maybe my questions will seem dumb to you, but I have two fears, river crossing and sand riding. I've been to Morocco and I, um, I, it was, it didn't well that, it didn't go that well on the sand with my um, BMW. Um, I have a GS700, so my first question to you would be, do you have any um, advice on how to handle that bike on sand and uh, whether is um, recommended at all to use front brake on, on sand. Chris, did you He got scared. <laughs> <laughs> so you don't have a KTM? <laughs> <laughs> he was in the wrong meeting. <laughs> Chris, are you? <laughs> I think he's dis dis disconnected, Chris. Yeah. 
Okay, so um, um, I so think you did, you did a great job on uh, in Morocco, Ramona. Come on, yes, <laughs> you're you being right. modest. <laughs> Being in Morocco, in Morocco with your bike, uh, it's it's really good. Maybe you can you can uh, uh, tell us how you got your bike there. Uh, it's, uh, um, I sent it there. I didn't ride the um, road from Romania to Morocco. It was sent there in south of Spain, and then afterwards we used the ferry to go to Morocco, do our tour, and then getting back the bikes in Spain, and then. Coming back to Romania. And, and your experience as a, as an adventure rider, uh, did you go there just directly from the street, or you you did a little bit of? Uh, uh, I only attended the um, um, training in Zernest, which Matei is doing. Mm -hmm. So I was uh, my experience was like three thousand kilometers ever. And then my really? 3000 <laughs> kilometers and you went to Morocco after yeah. the training with Chris yes. with uh, Matei. Yes. <laughs> okay. Okay. Okay, you're, you're you're here. Wonderful. We can yeah, hear yeah. you. So Ramona, Literally. maybe you could um, um, change the bike and ask the same question. I'm I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, Let's say I have a KTM which looks like a BMW <laughs> 700 right? And acts like it. So, a great KTM, I got it. <laughs> yes, a great KTM. My bike is not that much of an enduro bike or a, an adventure bike. It, 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 it behaves more like a street bike, on sand at least. So, um, on sand, when you're riding on sand an adventure bike, uh, can you use the front brake at all? Or it's something you don't do ever? I would never ever say to people, don't use your front brake, because, you know, if a car, camel, whatever it is, steps out in front of you, you need to use your front brake. But there is definitely some truth in that. Uh, you, you need to be way more subtle, way more um, gentle with your front brake inputs than you ever would be uh, in, in any other situation. Um, often when the sand is soft, just even just shutting the throttle is more than enough to, to scrub off the speed. Mm -hmm. Um, the real harsh thing with sand, especially on, on big adventure bikes, is the more aggressive you are, the faster you go, the easier it is. And that's it, what I heard. <laughs> you, yeah, and it, it's it's a whole like chicken and the egg sort of thing. Like, you know, um, I mean, you can see it in the Dakar. Like the, the guys will come into a refuel, they are going flat out across the desert. The bike's going dead straight. They're looking at the road book. They're not even worrying about it. They slow down for the refuel, the bikes starts to wiggle and mess around and it's really hard for them to get up and going again. Generally about, sort of most bikes, about 40 kilometers an hour, that's when they start to kind of rise up out of the sand and, and start to kind of plane across the top more and you're not pushing through that sand. So it's not about having to go absolutely full speed everywhere, but it's about just trying to hold that ground speed up enough that you're not falling down into the sand and wallowing around in it. And a good way to, to think about it is think of it like a boat. So when the boat's going too slow, it's pushing all the water in front of it and it's having to really, lots of corrections, the engine's working really hard. You put your foot on the gas, the boat pops up out of the, out of the water, off she goes. And, it, and it's very similar uh, with riding the, the, the bikes in that, in that soft conditions. Um, Thank you. Um... My second question regards uh, water crossing. What yep. do's and don'ts? Challenge. Do's and don'ts. <laughs> um, so that was definitely, I should say, that's definitely a um, uh, something we missed out from the adventure series. That's something we should have had in that we didn't. But it'll come in the next one, I promise you. <laughs> um, the key things I think is, is, I always say to guys, don't sacrifice wet spark plugs for wet feet. So. If you're not sure, especially if you're out exploring, adventuring by yourself, park your bike out, walk into the water, suss it all out, figure it out. The only goal in adventure riding is not drowning your bike in the river. Everything else is a bonus from there. Um, so take the time to, to suss it out, figure it out, and, and make a, a good, safe decision to start off with. Um, especially on a big bike, if you're by yourself, it's, it's a really, really dangerous situation. Or it can potentially be. Um, so it needs to be really treated with respect. Um, whenever I go into the water, I have my thumb on the kill switch ready to go. So 
if my bike falls into the water with the engine off most modern adventure bikes now the air boxes are so well designed you can stand the thing up it'll self-drain give it a second you start the bike up no problem uh, if you go into that water with the engine running it's likely to suck the water into the engine big engine damage potential you know you can be there for hours at, at a good at a good a good ending potentially you can destroy your engine sort of thing so the mistake a lot of guys will make is they'll go into the deep water and go, oh no, I've got to keep the engine running. Um, lots of RPM bikes, bad things happen. So I, I go the other way. Like if I think there's going to be any danger, if I start to lose my balance, just switch that engine off as quickly as you can. Um, around river crossings, you know, crossing, crossing rivers, uh, you always want to be trying to use the flow of the water to help you. Mm -hmm. So imagine uh, if the water is flowing this way, you would enter the river from up here and aim to exit it down here. So rather than trying to fight against that current, you're giving yourself room to kind of move with the current and cross across the, the river as an, as an angle. So you're starting upstream and finishing downstream. Yeah. Um, but the big thing I think with them is just is to treat the river crossings with respect. Don't be a hero. Take your time. Suss uh, just make sure you make a, a really good stuff a whole big trip down the south island of new zealand there'll be multiple multiple river crossings and i know there's going to be times where we're just going to have to team up get each bike through one at a time and just the only goal is just not to cock it up basically okay thank you so, hope that helps and uh, i think uh, dragoshi is the next one on the list with dragosh are you here Yes, yes. Hello, hello, Chris. Thank Hi. you for being with us. <clears throat> I have some questions and the first one is related to, uh, to suspension. You know, a lot of uh, boys, uh, especially, uh, want to play and tweak the suspension. Mm -hmm. What I would suggest maybe in a future video series is for you to make um, a video with the relation between the bike's behavior and then suspension setup, because we can never find online. For example, if the bike starts to, to wobble, uh, where should I go? Should I go to the preload? Mm -hmm. Should I go to the rebound? Where, what should I do? This is very difficult to understand for some people, for, for some non-technical people. Not, not everybody knows how the oil flows, cartridge flows, cartridge open, okay. things like this. Mm. Do you have any tip for a new rider or for a, uh, experienced rider but who never tweaked the suspension on uh, where to where to um, mess with first if okay. the bike doesn't behave the, the proper way so uh, it, and it's good to hear this because uh, in the the list of videos that we have for the dirt bike series that we're planning suspension is number two <laughs> it's second on the list so we're, we're on to it but um, some advice before that um, the first thing to do is to go through and record where your bike is to start off with. So count where each adjuster is on the bike to start off with. So example, like your fork compression, wind that all the way down, counting the clicks until it's completely bottomed out as high as it can go. So maybe like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Okay, that's a twelve. Write that down on a piece of paper. Set it back to where it was. Rebound all the way in. Count that write it down a piece of paper, go through every single adjuster of your bike and write that information down. Fold that piece of paper up and put it away somewhere really safe. So if you turn your bike into a complete wheelbarrow, you can just start again. You know where your base settings are and that takes away all the fear of getting it wrong. You know, you can't get it wrong now. You, you won't make your bike worse because you know where you were to start off with. Um, from there, you need to go and find a, a short trail or a short bit of riding that replicates where you want your bike to behave and get a, a good feel of what it's doing. From there, each adjuster at a time, you need to go for really big changes. So the mistake a lot of the two, two common mistakes people will make is they'll make multiple changes at one time. So they'll go, okay, a couple of clicks compression, a couple of clicks rebound, couple on the shock that's the thing and it's really hard to get that feeling you know even a, a very sorry i'm looking straight into that light but even a very very experienced rider will, will struggle to tell you exactly what's going on so the first thing you want to do is learn to understand exactly what these adjusters do in terms of riding down the trail so the first thing i would do is go right what does it feel like if i completely close my fork compression dampening 
Okay, it feels like that horrible type of crap. Okay. Wind it all completely open, uh, uh, all the way to the minus. Okay, now it feels like that horrible type of crap. So you're going to the full extent of the, of the range. And you do that for every single adjustment on the bike, individually, all the way in, all the way out. And all you're really trying to do is learn what these that particular adjuster does to the bike and how that makes it respond. Once you understand what those adjustments do, you can go out, ride your trail and go, okay, it kind of feels like maybe this was a bit like what it was when I had a nowhere near enough fork rebound. So you try winding in the fork rebound two or three clicks and you can start to sort of dial your bike in yourself from there. So this process takes a while. Um, so you've got to come into it with a headspace, but you know, I'm not going for a ride today. All I'm doing is figuring out how these suspension adjusters work. And that, that's the, uh, the important first step. Yeah, because in the in a in a ride the terrain changes so much, especially here in Romania. You can you can have uh, you know the soil that is uh, going under your bike, and then you have hard really comp uh, hard uh, gravel, and then you have uh, rocks, and then you complete. You always need to tweak and adjust something uh, to make your bike feel stable. Yeah, so you know I, I could never tell you how to set your bike up for you. Yeah, yeah, that's um, clear. But, but I can tell, but I can tell you how to go and learn how the adjusters work and give you the tools that you need to kind of figure it out for yourself. Um, <laughs> the other big thing I think for me with, with adventure riding is it's always a compromise. It's never going to be perfect everywhere because we have way too much change. Like by motocross, you can go, okay, I'm going to spend all practice getting this thing absolutely dialed into this track. But that's not our world. We always have to sacrifice somewhere. Perfect. Uh, then I would like to ask your personal opinion about tubes or tubeless. I'm so curious. Which one do you prefer? Tubes. Tubes. Clear. Yeah. In a story. Uh, okay. <laughs> then uh, my last question to you is, you know, uh, almost immediately after uh, anybody buys a motorcycle, an adventure motorcycle, starts to add accessories and things on the motorcycle one of those accessories are uh, the bar risers you know the, the manufacturers <laughs> cannot i know it's it's old discussion but you know some people are two meters tall some people are 165 170 the manufacturer cannot do the perfect uh, height uh, straight from the factory so they need something what, what what is your opinion about this should we continue to buy bar risers to feel a little bit comfortable or just copy the bike uh, the bike line high heels uh, dragos high heels <laughs> so i'm six foot two mm -hmm. uh, so not crazy tall but reasonably tall and i run lower than standard handlebars on all my motorbikes i'm trying to get the front end lower um so the opposite way to what most people are going um the bar risers are really good this is just my opinion right okay and, and this gets controversial really quickly um the bar risers do one thing really really well they make it very comfortable to ride your bike badly <laughs> yeah this is, really? this is <laughs> incredible yeah. So not even wants to hear the story, especially a company like TuraTech that makes really good money making bar rises. Um, sorry, I'm going to try and set the computer somewhere for Please you guys. Don't say something bad about TuraTech. Yeah, yeah, just put put your fingers in your ears for a second, Maria. <laughs> so, oh man, is this going to work? No, it's okay. So, if I'm standing up tall with my hips underneath me, to reach my bars, I get a big bend through my back. Really hard to see. Ah, need bar risers. Get some bar risers. All that pressure comes off my spine. But now I'm standing almost vertically. I have very little stability. When I hit that soft sand, when I hit that mud, it's really hard for me to control my upper body. If you use your hips and fold through your hips, the need for the bar risers goes away straight away. So as soon as I fold through my hips, I create way more spread through my body. I'm a lot stronger. My head and my shoulders come down and the stock bar height works. So for me, I like to ride more aggressively. You know, I'm, you know, I like the real off-road stuff. So I want more of that 
So I run a lower and then stand in front end to make that even more comfortable. So. Okay. The, what the about thing that gets me. The street riding, uh, do you need it for the street riding maybe? That's something I don't understand at all. Like why would you want your bars higher to ride on the street? Because you're, I don't know. The position is uh, how Drago said. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I, okay, I, it makes sense. What what, okay. what, uh, what Chris is saying makes sense, but you know, almost everybody I know runs by risers. This is clear. Yeah, it's great. It keeps, it, and it creates such a crappy riding position, it keeps me in a living. Because you know why? Because you cannot, <laughs> that position, that attack position that you uh, showed to us, it's very hard to maintain for hours and hours of riding. But yeah. maybe if you can combine sitting sitting with standing up, then it's okay to, to not to use bar risers. Yeah, well, that's sorry. I'm just trying to find somewhere where that sun's not so beautiful, that's not so punishing. <laughs> um, yeah, and that's, that's another uh, thing that we come up against a lot with doing the riding schools, is for some reason, adventure bike riders think it's not okay to sit down. And they think that sitting down is like giving up. Um, whereas sitting down is a really efficient way of riding your bike. And again, if you, if you go back to Dakar, right? Those guys are sitting down heaps. And it's not to be lazy, it's not to try and save energy, it's to go as fast as you can. And when we do our riding schools, we spend equal as amount of time working on the seated cornering, seated techniques, as we do standing cornering, standing techniques. And it's not about, you know, I prefer to stand up or I prefer to sit down. You have to work both sides of riding out and work out which is appropriate in the terrain and the situation that you're in. And I, I you know, without trying to, you know, I'm the man sort of thing, but often when we're on these big group rides, probably there's times where I'm the only guy standing up and there's times where I'm the only person sitting down as well. That's, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's clear. Thank you so much for your answers.